All right. Uh, thank you all for coming today to our Latte and Learn, Solving for the Special Education Teacher Shortage in New Jersey. Before we get started, just a couple of things. We are recording and we will send out the recording in our follow-up email tomorrow. We also are reserving some time for Q&A at the end of the hour. So if you have any questions, just go down to that Q&A button in your Zoom window and you can drop those questions in there and we will get to those. I'd like to introduce our panel today, our host, Jason Lang is the founder and president of Bloomboard, a talent development provider that supports school districts with educator pipeline, advancement, and retention solutions. Prior to founding Bloomboard, Jason worked in private equity and was also a member of the New Schools Venture Fund team, where he supported the development of the initial EdTech investment thesis for the New Schools Seed Fund, now Reach Capital. Dr. Kristen Hawley Turner is the chair of education and full professor in Casper, Casperson School of Graduate Studies at Drew University. Her research focuses on the intersections between technology and literacy, and she works with teachers across the content areas to implement effective literacy instruction and to incorporate technology in meaningful ways. She's co-authored of Connected Reading, Teaching Adolescent Readers in a Digital World, and Argument in the Real World, Teaching Students to Read and Write Digital Texts. She's editor of Ethics of Digital Literacy, Developing Knowledge and Skills Across Grade Levels. She's currently working on a book about AI and writing in the classroom. She's also the founder and director of the Drew Writing Project and Digital Literacies Collaborative. And we have Dr. Dennis Copeland. He's the director of human resources for the Hamilton Township School District in Mercer County, New Jersey, where he focuses on employee recruitment, development, and retention. Prior to his current role, he served 18 years as a successful principal at the elementary, middle, and high school levels, including two blue ribbon schools, two responsive classroom schools, and a 2019 national school to watch. He has expertise in turnaround principals, designing full inclusion schools, and adolescent mental health. Thank you all for being here today, and I will pass the mic to Jason. Thank you, and I really appreciate it. Super excited about the Pretty amazing sort of group we have here to sort of talk a little bit about the shortage, talk a little bit about sort of what we're trying, what we're seeing in the field more broadly around trying to address some of those bigger needs, and then really get into some, you know, your questions. What are the sort of ways, what are the sort of approaches, uh, what are some other things that sort of experts in the field are doing to really try and help sort of stave off, you know, the crisis that I think we're in from a, from a talent standpoint. <clears throat> Want to start off, Dr. Copeland, if you can, which is a little bit of a sense of sort of the background in Hamilton, sort of your background in terms of what you're all seeing, what you're sort of working through, um, and how you're sort of thinking about sort of the bigger sort of staffing sort of vacancy structure, if you don't, you don't mind kicking us off. Sure. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so Hamilton Township uh, School District, we are the 10th largest uh, in the state of New Jersey. Uh, there are uh, over 600 school districts uh, in New Jersey. Uh, Hamilton is composed of 24 schools, uh, 17 elementary, three middle, three high schools, and one alternative secondary school. Uh, we educate uh, a little over 12,000 students. Uh, we have a staff of 1,871. And uh, with that comes five bargaining units, uh, five contracts that, uh, that uh, we work with. Uh, Specifically, our special ed teachers, uh, we have uh, approximately 227 special education teachers, uh, pre-K through 12. Uh, that does not include CST members. Uh, so reviewing uh, our uh, hiring, uh, retirees and resignations for uh, the prior 12 months, 23-24 uh, school year, uh, we hired 137 uh, new certificated uh, teachers. Uh, we had 26 retirees during that time period. And we had 84 resignations. Uh, of those 84 resignations, 21 were special ed. Uh, and uh, we currently have 10 special ed vacancies. Uh, so we are always seeking uh, avenues and opportunities to increase uh, and sustain uh, our uh, special ed uh, population. 
Yeah, and can you say a little bit more? I mean, I find it interesting. You, you all are actually in a, probably a better position than most, just based on sort of you know sort of attrition and some of the rates we're seeing. Um, just sort of interested in sort of if you have some some broader sort of perspective and just sort of how you feel like that sort of fits in the in the sort of the New Jersey context. Because I know we look at the national data in a sense, but just sort of wondering how you're thinking you're doing compared to most of the other folks that you're already working with and around the state. Sure, sure. We we are in a in a good position. Uh, we're not in the position where we have 100% uh, fill rates, uh, but we are getting there. Uh, speaking with my colleagues and uh, reading the newspapers, you know, we we see a mixed bag of uh, hiring uh, happening throughout the state. Uh, we have districts that uh, have lost uh, state aid, and as a result, uh, they were forced uh, to reduce. Uh, their staffing. Uh, and then we have other districts that have maintained or possibly increased their state aid. So they are able uh, to maintain their current levels, if not add additional uh, positions uh, within their district. Love it. And so can you talk a little bit sort of just about, I know, you know, sort of the, as you think about sort of the challenges is think about sort of the, the sort of space today, which has obviously changed a little bit just in the last five, 10 years alone. Sort of what are you seeing now across sort of this re recruitment retention, you know, sort of now what sort of paradigm in terms of where y'all are trying to sort of help manage and support? Yourself? Sure. So with recruitment, uh, what happened 10 years ago is not happening today. Uh, <laughs> there are greater uh, avenues and greater opportunities uh, for individuals to become certified as teachers uh, and for districts uh, to to look for uh, individuals uh, outside of the traditional uh, format. We, we still have the traditional uh, methods uh, through the universities and through alternate uh, routes, uh, but those pathways are opening up and uh, we are seeing uh, support at the state legislative level uh, in the governor's office as well uh, to allow us uh, to, to, find ca uh, to find candidates uh, in places that uh, we traditionally did not find them. So with that, some of the challenges that uh, HR leaders are, are facing, uh, specifically here in New Jersey, but, but also nationwide, um, recruitment. Uh, and, and with recruitment, some of the strategies that, uh, that we use, um, here in New Jersey, uh, there was an organization known as CJ Pride, which uh, recently went through a name change. It's now known as NJ Stride. Uh, our goal is to uh, connect with other uh, HR leaders uh, throughout the state, uh, specifically uh, with the purpose of diversifying our workforce. Uh, so we are composed of over 70 school districts uh, and uh, we communicate, we uh, provide professional development, uh, and most importantly, we support one another uh, in finding uh, candidates and, and just assisting uh, each other with that recruitment process. So uh, it would be encouraged, regardless of what state you're in, uh, to, to find others uh, that have uh, common uh, ideas and uh, begin to build that uh, coalition and that consortium where you can support one another. Uh, here in Hamilton, we also uh, provide uh, district job fairs, uh, and we, we do that several times during the school year, where we will hold our own in-house job fair for individuals to, uh, to come and apply uh, for positions. Uh, something else we do is uh, our student teachers. So we have a number of uh, partnerships with universities and student teachers uh, are, are in our classrooms throughout the school year. Uh, we will also um, register and, and have those student teachers become substitute teachers so they can uh, provide substitute services uh, with compensation uh, at different times during the year. Uh, and then also with our recruitment, uh, we have strong university partnerships uh, where we can uh, reach out uh, in cases of need uh, for specific positions. Uh, another challenge is retention. So once they are in your district, how do you keep them there? Uh, we have a very comprehensive uh, induction program. It's four years uh, and it provides uh, support and professional development to new teachers uh, within the district. Uh, 
uh, staff empowerment. Uh, we, we provide opportunities for our staff uh, to become part of district committees, uh, community committees, and uh, contribute uh, in a way that benefits the entire organization. Uh, we also uh, have a stay interview. So this is for individuals uh, who are in the district, and we are curious to find out why they stay in the district. Uh, it's a random uh, interview. We could either be in person or um, or, or uh, through a survey, uh, but we collect that data, we, we review it, and we look at what are we doing well, and then what are some areas, common themes that we're seeing uh, need uh, attention. Uh, also pathways. So we are looking at, and we have pathways uh, to teaching uh, for some of our uh, power professionals, classroom aides. Uh, they're known as ed assistants here in uh, Hamilton, uh, but they have some college uh, work, uh, but not the degree. So uh, we have provided a, a pathway to teaching certification for them uh, through a partnership. Uh, we also have a pathway to teaching for those classroom ed assistants uh, that do have a college degree, but it's not in teaching. Uh, and again, the opportunity uh, is for them to, uh, to eventually become a teacher and uh, continue working uh, in um, Hamilton. And then pathways to endorsements. Uh, and that is uh, what we are currently exploring. Uh, these would, this would be for current teachers uh, and providing them an opportunity to obtain another New Jersey endorsement, whether it's uh, middle school, uh, middle school content area, or uh, an area that we have just uh, previously uh, touched on, special education, uh, and then resignation. You know, so recruitment, retention, resignation. So now, now what? Uh, an individual has submitted their resignation. What what do you do? Um, so some strategies that we work with, uh, I contact every staff member that has uh, submitted a resignation, just trying to get a sense of uh, why is there uh, the need to, to resign. Uh, we also provide them with an exit interview, uh, and that uh, can either be in person or, again, through a survey. Uh, as soon as we, we receive a resignation, we look to have a one hour response rate, meaning that we want to get that job posting up within one hour. Um, even though the board has not approved the uh, resignation, uh, the position would, the opening would be anticipated. Uh, we do have a 60 day hold where individuals are held uh, per their contract to 60 days to allow us the opportunity to fill the position. Of course, if it is filled uh, prior to that, uh, we do release the individual. Uh, and then finally, uh, a conversation with the principal. So I will reach out to the principal uh, to get a sense of, uh, is there something else that we are unaware of why this individual ha has uh, chosen uh, to resign? Uh, so again, recruitment, retention, resignation, uh, these are all some strategies that uh, HR leaders uh, will implement, uh, as well as many others, and some of the challenges that we are facing. Love it. And I'm, I'm interested, I mean, just given sort of how these, you know, how much this has sort of evolved, Dr. Turner, I'm sort of fascinated with sort of your lens, given the, as you've been sort of seeing, you know, the ed prep world evolve over the last few years, sort of how is that sort of thought about sort of in your thought of mental process across both the partnership that we're now sort of working towards, but just more broadly, I'm just in for, for a lot of our ends, I think trying to get some really good sort of candid ed prep perspective on how the field is evolving is just helpful sort of context that leads into obviously some of the, the special ed sort of endorsement areas and some of these other sort of newer on the job degrees. Uh, so can you just talk about sort of what you've seen from sort of your, your lens across state? Sure, thanks Jason, thanks for being here. And thank you, Dr. Copeland. It's always wonderful to have conversations across the K-12 school system and the university preparation providers, um, because sometimes I think that we get a little bit in our own worlds and it's really coming together that's going to help education be the best that it can be for New Jersey students. And of course then nationally, but we're focusing on New Jersey today. Drew's program has always believed that the best preparation is hands-on preparation. And in order to have clinically rich programs, we have to partner with school districts. And so we have really tried to think 
outside the box, um, sometimes working around CBAs and, and other um, issues that come into play to help develop teachers on the job, um, partnering with districts. Uh, Dr. Copeland mentioned um, you know, uh, student teachers as substitutes. Um, we've actually partnered with districts to have our interns working as paras in the school too, you know? And so, so there are ways with initial teacher preparation that the, the work across university and K-12 can really be what benefits and what is gonna move the profession forward. Um, I think that the pandemic certainly threw everyone for a loop and preparation um, had to change for everybody, but also kind of on the job training for teachers in that moment had to, ch to change as well. And for Drew's program, because technology was one of the cores of what we did, we were able to pivot um, pretty quickly with our interns. And they were really able to support teachers in their technology learning. And so I think sometimes thinking about how newer teachers to the field who may, who may have maybe not the understanding pedagogically yet of how to use technologies, but may have a little bit more facility, um, kind of rethinking expertise and more in line with partnerships um, and in terms of novice teachers and expert teachers partnering in the classroom. So that's that's something that we've also tried to do looking at co-teaching models where we have mentorships in the classroom. Um, in terms of our add-on endorsements, this is something uh, we believe we have an ESL endorsement, uh, the state of New Jersey calls it ESL. We know that it's about English language learning, but we have an ESL endorsement and a TOSD or Teacher of Students with Disabilities endorsement that we have always tried to meet uh, teachers where they are in the classrooms. And those endorsements have always been offered online. Um, but we have still run into uh, the flexibility option for teachers to take a full semester um, graduate level course and learn how to be a teacher of students with disabilities in um, whatever context they are in. So one of the things that we have looked to do is to really think about alternative pathway options for those add-on endorsements, where we can, um, through CE licenses, schools can put teachers into the positions that need to be filled. And Dr. Copeland mentioned their vacancies. Um, as long as a teacher in New Jersey has that initial certification, they can take a CE approved special education add-on certificate, be in that situation and be supported both by the mentoring in the school as well as the mentoring from the university as they, they learn those knowledge and skills. Um, so this is something that we have been thinking about and working on um, for the eight years that I have been at Drew University and back in New Jersey. Um, and our partnership with Bloomboard, I think, takes that to the next level. So um, we are looking at a 21 credit um, TOSD endorsement program, which is the state mandate. Um, as we all know, whether we are in K-12 or in higher ed, the state really controls a lot of the decisions that we can make. So we have a program um, that we have developed with seven courses or 21 credits. And if you look at the titles of our courses, you'll see kind of what, what is underlying what we believe, particularly for teachers of students with disabilities, but for all teachers is that they are advocates. They're advocates for students and families. Um, they're advocates for the profession. And so we really focus on thinking about all learners and diverse learners ac across the board when we're thinking about teachers of students with disabilities. And you'll see that in um, the names of the courses. But more importantly, um, these seven courses that we're gonna be offering through Bloomboard are not what you would necessarily think of as a traditional graduate level course. We have been working on revamping the structure of those courses so that they are portfolio based and on the job based where as a teacher engages in learning about uh, the knowledge and skills and dispositions of being a teacher of students with disabilities, they are able to demonstrate their skills through portfolio work that's actually happening in the classroom. Um, we've also condensed each class so that it is a targeted, let's focus on this for three or four weeks, um, demonstrate our learning and um, then move on to the next set of skills. So it's, it's a progression based skills. In terms of the uh, endorsement program, it is graduate level. And um, we know that although we would love for a teacher to come in and take three or four courses a semester and be done with um, the whole program in a year, which they absolutely can, 
we understand that funding from uh, districts for graduate level coursework is, is tied to uh, contracts and bargaining. Um, and so it is possible for a teacher to add on this endorsement over the course of two years, which is the length of the CE license. Um, and they can be placed in those special education settings while they are enrolled in the CE program, as long as they complete the program within that two years. Um, so it can be sped up, it can be spread out as needed, um, but ultimately we're trying to make uh, developing the knowledge and skills, which we believe actually makes you a better teacher of all students. So even if you don't end up as a special education teacher forever, going through this program is going to improve your teaching overall. We're trying to make that as flexible as possible and really help teachers to apply the knowledge and skills that they're learning. And really, I mean, I think the way we've started to see this and the way we sort of to sort of tie these together is, right, things are really different than they were five, 10 years ago. Right? And the, the context has changed, post-COVID has changed. I think a lot of what we're, we Bloomboard sort of have seen, just given the work we do across the country is, right, we know that teachers are feeling a lot more burned right now, right? And so the idea that, right, sort of any advancement pathway, whether it's an add-on certificate, whether it's an initial license, it feels like a lot given all the other things that are happening. And what we know is, right, there's just the, the ed prep pool is getting smaller because people have a lot more, right, options in colleges these days. And we, you know, for generations told young women that they should go be teachers. And now, fortunately, we tell them they can go do anything they want. And so the idea that we have, right, sort of a really interesting sort of, right, sort of set of external circumstances that are really starting to sort of make the candidate pool just much, much shallower is real. And I think a lot of what we've been having in the conversation with Drew and the conversation more nationally is, well, what does it then mean to try to redesign the higher ed delivery structure to meet people where they are today? And I think that's actually the really fundamental question. And so as we've been going through that, right, there's this really interesting paradigm shift where we're starting to see people go from, right, when we used to ask people come to campus, right, you got to drive here, you got to do parking, right, you got to get time out of your day, we're going to sort of do courses and lectures. And that worked when you're in your 20s, and when you're sort of going through, right, and you've got time and space to figure things out. But for adult learners, right, and people who are already employed full time, the idea of spending a whole time during your day, and then going and doing sort of coursework afterwards in sort of multi hour chunks, or taking somebody who's in a classified role and the idea that they're going to go back to school and be able to earn a bachelor's degree in special education, that's a really heavy lift these days. And so what we're super excited about is this idea that we're really fundamentally changing the approach to how we confer three credit courses. And you know, I always joke, my back in my teacher prep days, right, my old school professors used to play these videos from two decades earlier, and he would pause the video periodically and say, all right, which student is in his or her zone of proximal development? And then we would debate ZPDs for an entire class session. And right, it was not connected to any of the kids or any of my classrooms that I would ever be in. And so it just was so theory-based, right, that it didn't feel like something that I was ever going to really be able to apply. And so the idea that all of a sudden, not only can we move the degree and the language and this sort of engagement all the way into the classroom and actually have candidates working on real work with kids, with their students, right, and real pedagogy, and then having amazing faculty give them annotated time-stamped coaching on their craft, on what's actually working. And so we have, you know, our folks in this new sort of add-on endorsement, they're actually working, right, in a special ed context, videotaping themselves, taking their lesson plans, taking their student work, and they're using that portfolio to earn that same three credit course that we used to do in the sort of the sit and, you know, sort of lecture model. And not only does that make it a ton more convenient, but it really does start to change how we think about what does it mean for us to be able to sort of reach now, not only sort of current educators who might be feeling like, how do I add one more thing on, right? We know that that's always the sort of the math that folks are going through, or how do we reach this new set of, right? In January, we'll launch the first these sort of on the job bachelor's degree. So we're super excited about that as well. And so how do we then start to think about, you know, what are the paras, right? Classified staff in and around your buildings that can really start to engage and would want to move into a teaching role if we could solve some of their time and space and cost issues by embedding the degrees into their job. And it's just a very interesting shift. So that could be interesting sort of from your runs as we've been so having conversations like, 
How do you think that sort of meets some of the needs in terms of where your staff are today and sort of in this sort of paradigm shift? And then Dr. I'd love to talk a little bit about your sort of sense of sort of how that shift has, has sort of taken from the faculty side. So Jason, absolutely, I, I agree with you and, and HR leaders would also agree with you that uh, the way that students learn uh, today and acquire uh, experience uh, is different than it was 20 years ago. Um, the employer and the the industry need to be more flexible with uh, the other things that are happening in the lives of employees, uh, from family to to all of the other stuff that comes along with being an employee. So just as we ask teachers to meet students where they are, uh, the employers and the industry need to meet the employees where they are. So providing options, uh, providing on the job experience, uh, give, giving value uh, to the work that they do uh, on a daily basis and finding some structure by which it can be measured uh, and assessed. Love it. And so, Dr. Turner, with that sort of lens, I mean, can you think, as we think about these this set of courses, right, given the sort of states, like, how does that sort of sit differently in terms of some of those artifacts and portfolios? Because I think that sort of really brings it to life in terms of really, you know, what do we want folks to be able to do in their classrooms as they're sort of earning the, the add-on? And what does that look like from that sort of, you know, sort of faculty support lens? Um, yeah, first of all, I love uh, what you said, Dr. Copeland, about meeting the employees where they are and, and taking into account their needs. Because when we think about advancement or professional development, it really is adult learners that we're looking at. So we wanna think about differentiation. And the reason I bring up differentiation is because it's a key part of what teachers of students with disabilities do and think about. And we hope that all teachers are thinking about this, but it's, it's definitely a part of the program. Um, so for example, in um, one of the classes, we really focus on a differentiated lesson plan. Um, and so we could, Jason, to use your example of before, we could give examples of that in a university class and we could even do that in an online class and we have, and we can talk about it. And then we can ask them to go and do it and then maybe write one. But the, the shift here is that we're gonna maybe do some reading or some thinking about um, differentiated lesson planning. We are gonna do some learns based on what the teacher needs to learn. And this is also an interesting thing because teachers who are going to do this add-on endorsement all have a certification. The state of New Jersey requires six credits of special education in an initial teacher preparation program. But what those six credits are, are going to be different uh, for every preparation program. So. What, what one teacher might need, another teacher might have already gotten. So this approach says, all right, well, you might need to learn a little bit more about differentiation, or you might need to learn a little bit more about um, universal design for learning, or you might've already learned that, so you can jump right to the next thing. But ultimately, what we want you to show is your ability to use these concepts in the classroom with real students. And so we want you to create a differentiated lesson plan and apply it in the classroom and then reflect on it. And that's part of the portfolio. So it's something you've already been doing for your job um, that we are going to be assessing. It's not going to be something that would be extra for the university. Um, and so that that um, thinking about what a learner needs and differentiating for that learner is really the hallmark of what this program would be. And really, I think what we've heard to that point, right? We know this from national board research. We know this from residency research, right? The more we can connect and actually give teachers real feedback on their actual classroom experience, the more that not only changes their their practice in, for the better, but actually the more it actually impacts and improves their student outcomes. And so that's really the sort of the goal is, can we sort of really push all of the feedback and work all the way down into the classrooms? And what does that look like to sort of ultimately sort of launch that? Um, I wanna make sure we've got room for questions here. So if you have any questions, obviously please feel free to put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A. Um, we'll sort of make sure we can talk through them and sort of get all the feedback in here. 
Um, I guess I wanted to sort of think through just from a, you know, as you think more broadly about the pipeline, New Jersey is an interesting state in that, right, you you don't have a t uh, special ed, right, sort of bachelor sort of structure, and that the add-on always has to come through that. And so, Dr. Coben, I, I mentioned sort of as you think about sort of more the, the broader sort of continuum of talent and trying to sort of bring folks, right, into schools, get good placements, and then sort of advance people up. We find this in, in high school science and math, right? I don't think we're going to get a lot more folks coming from math degrees. And so the idea that we're going to have to build and sort of cultivate, right, our, right, sort of add-on licensure areas from within middle school, elementary schools and ele elevate people and really try to manage that. I mentioned what you've seen so far in terms of how has that process taken shape in your, your existing work and how do you think about that more sort of systemically just as the way you're thinking about the pipeline more broadly? Sure, sure. So uh, within the district, we we do encourage uh, teachers uh, to professionally grow. Uh, part of that uh, PD, part of that growth uh, does include uh, obtaining uh, additional certifications, uh, whether uh, it's in a content area, uh, whether it's an endorsement, uh, or whether it's as an administrator. Uh, so we do have an active uh, um, um, practice of encouraging uh, existing staff members to, to further their uh, professional growth. Uh, and then systematically, uh, any opportunities that uh, exist out there from third parties, such as universities or, or other organizations like Bloomberg, uh, to help us through that process, uh, to have the courses uh, convenient for staff and 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 convenient could be online. Uh, convenient could be a cohort uh, physically within the district uh, where the instructional services, the teaching come to the district so the employees don't have to travel. Uh, so whatever conveniences can be offered uh, to staff uh, are always uh, convenient or positive and uh, support that employee as well as the district. And I really think, I mean, I, where, where we see already the field headed, and you mentioned sort of the corporate world, which I find is a fascinating corollary, right? Yep. It's frankly the people who are stealing most of our teachers, which is obviously problematic, right? And now that we've got, you know, if Target and Amazon can buy you a bachelor's degree while you're, you know, coming to work, I think I talked to a superintendent in HR uh, soup the other day who lost a special ed pair to a Bucky's. You know, and if we're now losing special educators to fast food chains like that, that's soul crushing. But in her sense, like Bucky's, you know, they were going to put her on a management track, right, and buy her a bachelor's degree. And so we know, right, that, that there is a lot of competition in the world today for, right, sort of our, our sort of core, right, staff. And so the really question is, right, how do we think about, right, obviously with the the special ed sort of add-on area, that's one to think about how do you retain someone, help them make some more money and move up the salary schedule and how do we embed that in the practice? I think what we know is where the profession is going and where a lot of the corporate world is going is the more you can make this sort of on the job development also equivalent to degrees, that's the home run. And that I would argue that in the next three, five years, right, we're already seeing pretty amazing leaps in, you know, across the country in Illinois, New York, Florida, right, sort of Virginia, where we have a whole bunch of new, right, sort of higher ed partners in school districts really thinking about, right, if you're going to do, right, sort of creating messages in the community saying, well, if you're going to do the greatest good you could do to society, which I would argue is be a teacher, right, and help the next generation of kids, you should be able to earn that degree, right, while on the job without this sort of a ton of extra inconvenience on top of that. And ideally, you should be able to have that paid for and subsidized pretty heavily by someone else. And so certainly, you know, we could talk a little bit, I'd love to go up and talk a little bit about the credit reimbursement work, Dr. Turner, sort of about what other creative models I know you all have been doing and working with the state on different funding and different sort of apprenticeship pathways, which we're always trying to sort of go and sort of create in the model, because really the goal is how do we get as much outside funding to help subsidize these degrees so people don't have to pay necessarily out of pocket for them? And how do we embed those degrees directly into the job to really make it something that doesn't feel like it's an inconvenience and an actual right sort of added set of work, but it's really about coaching on your practice to help you get better and help you really feel like I know exactly where I'm going and this is going to help me be even more successful in my role. And so I'm just sort of interested sort of as you've been thinking about sort of those different pieces, sort of how does that how's that played out in your in work today? 
So we, uh, funding is always an issue and it's something we struggle with coming from the university perspective. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with our universe, our K-12 partners, trying to think through how, how do we actually pay interns or student teachers because they are acting in the capacity of co-teacher. They are bringing more eyes, more hands, more feedback to the students in a district and they are paying to do that. So they are not getting paid. Uh, so uh, we've had a few districts who are willing to work with us. There is nothing in our regulations that says student teachers can't be paid. Um, so we've been trying to work through that in terms of placing them as paraprofessionals um, and thinking about other ways, as I mentioned before. Uh, but what I what I really been thinking about is the equity issue that um, has kind of been touched upon here and thinking about how we can help paraprofessionals who don't have bachelor's degrees make the leap into teaching because we know that a lot of paraprofessionals would love to be that teacher of record in the classroom. Um, they would love to be working more at a, a more advanced way, in a more advanced way with students in the district, but there are a lot of barriers for them to get the bachelor's degree that would lead to certification, let alone come to a master of arts in teaching program um, like the one that Drew has, which is a more traditional face-to-face -face program. And so this conversation is what we've really been focused on and why, you know, we've jumped into partnership with Bloomboard because there is a model that allows for this. And we are really excited about that. And kind of the byproduct of that is that we are thinking about our other programming and how teachers can continue their education. Because for me, that's what it's all about. It's about lifelong learning as a teacher, always trying to get better, um, thinking about new technologies, new pedagogies, how that's going to meet the learners in my classroom. And so I want teachers to keep learning and I don't want costs to be a barrier to them. So Drew has done everything we can to keep tuition low for those programs, um, even though we're a private institution that work, the mentoring is such a big part of who we are. And so working alongside of schools who are gonna be mentoring teachers as they move into new roles, whether it's a para stepping into a teacher role or a, um, a K-6 teacher who's now going to be stepping into a special education role, we know there's mentoring happening. We also know that um, it's very hard to get to all those classrooms and give them the mentoring they want. So we can provide some of that. And we're hoping that school districts will, as Dr. Copeland said, kind of look to the flexibility to think about how we can fund the development of teachers. Uh, there are a lot of great examples of grow your own programs. And the other thing that I wanted to say is about retention. So if we, um, a lot of the research on grow your own programs, which is where you are really cultivating um, maybe even the K to 12 students who come out of your schools to come back, but also the paraprofessionals who are working in the schools, the teachers who are staying and giving them the support that they need, um, then you will keep them longer. So if we could kind of build that into pre preparation and continued development and growth, then we're hoping to, to help with the retention, which again, helps with the funding of it all. So there's a lot of ideas out there and we are just excited to be part of this conversation and to bring some of this to New Jersey districts. Dr. Copeland, anything you'd add there just in terms of sort of how you all have been architecting some of these? Sure. So let's take a look at student teachers and student teachers are a resource. So we consider them a resource that uh, the more we have, uh, the stronger we can become uh, as an organization. Now, there is a competition for that scarce resource. And oh. so we have to be very creative in, in how we attract that resource. Uh, a, a neighboring district is doing an excellent, excellent job with a model where they will be paying students teachers uh, of, of different types of uh, content areas. Um, but that is a local district where we now have to compete with for that resource. And um, again, it, it's this competition for scarce resources. Uh, the same way with paying teachers signing bonuses, yeah. which has been uh, tried uh, throughout the state and some districts started and they have concluded. Other districts are currently uh, actively uh, paying sign, sign on bonuses. But again, that's another resource that we have to consider. How are we going to also be as attractive 
uh, as those um, other districts. So with the funding piece, we have primarily seen two sources of funding. Uh, one source of funding is the local tax base. And, and getting back to Dr. Turner's point of equity, uh, some districts are in a better position uh, with local taxes and the levies they have than other districts. So again, that brings into the issue of equity. Um, and then the other source of funding uh, has been corporate funding. Uh, several years ago, uh, you had the, the CEO of Facebook uh, donate uh, several uh, million dollars to the uh, District of Newark, uh, specifically for the purpose of some type of bonus system uh, for, uh, for teachers there. Um, but other than local taxes and corporate funding, uh, we, we are limited in, in what we can uh, count on uh, on an annual basis uh, to, to do any uh, type of um, uh, compensation for uh, student teachers. And we've actually seen, I mean, this is also where obviously the student teachers is a little different sort of lens because you're still in that sort of, you know, mostly that 20 year old population. I would say what we have found more broadly is the more you start looking within the community, either in classified folks who you're already working with, right, often who live within 12 miles of the high school they graduated from, often whose kids go to the schools, they vote for the school boards. And so, right, we know that the classified staff is a much less transient sort of population as well. And so that's a pretty interesting sticky one, just from a retention standpoint. I would also say we've seen, Dr. Turner, to your point, we have seen a whole lot of districts start to now think about the idea of like, is my high school graduating class my next future pipeline to try to start to staff my middle, my, you know, elementary schools? And can I start to convince, because we know they're, you know, especially in the Gen Z, you know, Gen Alpha world, right? There are a lot of people who are very wary of the debt and very wary of, right? Have seen family members go through four years of college, rack up a bunch of debt and are working in retail and are very worried about that scenario. And so the idea now that we've seen districts start to recruit pretty actively, right? Their students and say, hey, if you're worried about debt, right? We now have an ability for you. We'll hire you full time as a para, we'll help get you your degree. And now we can add Pell funding to it, right? Which obviously helps subsidize that. There are new apprenticeship sort of applications that'll be coming out sort of in the next few months here. And so we help a bunch of districts on the Bloomboard side. We're actually an apprenticeship sponsor for several of our districts across four or five different states at this point. And so we're always trying to sort of access more of those funds, but really the idea is, can you sort of find and identify those students earlier help get them into a para role, get them a degree, a bachelor's degree on the job so that they can actually sort of start to really sort of move forward in their career. And then you've got them for three, four years post-graduation, right? But they can then, you know, then you know, they may still go off and go do something else, but at least you've had a five, seven, eight year employee in there working as a para, working as a teacher. And that's a really interesting way to start to think about sort of reconstituting what that teacher teacher pipeline looks like because we've seen a lot of interest from sort of candidates in the process um, and seeing where that's all moving. So it's just a sort of, a, again, a very different framing from sort of the lens um, and the process. On that note, I'm interested in sort of how you all have thought about, you know, just given the, the different perspective and the tech savviness, right? I think a lot of often what we find is as HR directors, right? Sort of, you know, frankly, as sort of folks who aren't digital natives and didn't right, have all of the level of technology that folks have now, how have you thought about sort of the shift in, you know, some of that learning and some of the ways that you've been sort of trying to work with staff just to recognize the difference in the Gen Z perspective, both from a staff development standpoint, but also from a, you know, sort of a, a student standpoint on the, the sort of the university side, because I know that's one of these things that comes up over and over again is we tend to build things that we remember that we would want back when we were in that age. And it's a very different mentality these days in terms of how people think about sort of technology and like. And so just mention your perspectives on that. And again, if there's other questions, I want to make sure we've got some time for Q&A here um, to open it up. But if there's other questions, please feel free to just plug them into the chat or into the Q&A. Um, but thoughts on the on sort of the, just the shift in Gen Z lens and sort of how you all have tried to sort of meet the, meet folks where they are and meet that sort of different perspective, even how different it is. Marco? Sure, sure. So what we are seeing from from student teachers as well as new teachers, uh, first, second year out of college, the number one thing that they are looking for 
uh, in an employer uh, is support. They want to know that they will be supported. Uh, when we meet students at recruitment fair, job fairs, uh, when we meet them at new teacher orientation, when we talk to them uh, during their first and second years, they are telling us they just want to know what type of support they will get. Uh, is there more support? Um, the first question is not how much will I be paid, but it's will I be supported? And, and we see that consistently um, at least in Hamilton, when we are talking with candidates and then once we hire people and, and they are on board, uh, they want that support. Uh, and that support will also translate into how can I grow professionally? Are there additional certifications and opportunities for me uh, to get better and be better at my craft and maybe uh, to teach something different uh, a couple of years from now? but support is what we are primarily seeing with that Gen Z crowd. And I think we certainly seen, you know, the idea of the 30 year teacher who's coming, you know, who's going to come in and teach elementary for 30 years. Like that is just, that is just not the, not in any way going to be the norm, right? From the sort of next generation. I think the average tenure in, in any company these days is getting, you know, in the two, three year, four year range. And so I think it's really about, again, trying to think about like, how do you then redesign the actual pipeline to acknowledge that that's just a fundamental reality? And if we're still trying to build pipelines based on average tenures of 15, 20 years, we're going to end up stuck pretty quickly. And so it really is trying to think through like, yes, it's going to take a little bit more, but the more you can make that a reliable pipeline of four years, right? That's actually a much easier system to build and design against because you know that it's going to have right some amount of churn but you can build that in, you can build more on-ramps, right? More equitable on-ramps into the profession and more sort of subsidized on-ramps to really help sort of bolster the funnel because we know it's going to have to look different because the funnel, right? We're no longer in the world where you put up an application and you're going to get 500, you know, right. 300 recs. It just doesn't happen anymore. No. Dr. Jenna, how have you thought, how have you seen that sort of the Gen Z lens sort of shift in what we all been doing? <laughs> So I, I have been um, working in teacher education for 20 years, but when I started teaching in the last century, which is my newest joke, I literally started teaching in the last century. That's funny. Well I, I was, I know it's scary. I was the teacher that played with technology. Um, I had a brother who was five years younger than me. So he was a different tech generation than I was. And he taught me and he was closer in age to my first set of students. And so they were on remember AOL and instant messenger, they were doing that outside of school. And so I was just curious about it. And then I said, well, you know, we're doing these book clubs in English class. What do you guys think about talking about them with each other at night on instant messaging? And so I just worked with my students to see like what makes sense. I didn't want to appropriate anything they were doing, but I learned alongside of them. So then I moved into teacher education, realizing that the shift in technologies were really important in the real world. And my teachers needed to be using them to prepare students for the real world, whatever that was going to be after K-12. And so when I started in teacher education, that was a real, um, I got a lot of pushback from uh, the students that I was working with. And then over the last two decades, the pushback has become less. And I feel like this group of teachers coming out of our programs has a healthy skepticism about technology, which I think is good. Um, because we don't want to just use technology for technology's sake. There's a lot of screen time issues, things like that. We don't want to just say, hey, I'm the teacher. I use technology. I have PowerPoints. Check the box, right? Um, but we want to be using technology in authentic ways. So that's what we try to do in our program. And um, in this on-the-job program, it's even more authentic because the technologies that teachers are using are the ones they are actually using to do their job. And then the learning management system um, by the way, all of my students who have used the Bloomboard platform love the Bloomboard platform. Um, and so that learning management system is something that is not tripping them up. It's not getting in the way, but it's helping them with learning. So moving from a, I don't see technology as a way I can learn to, of course, technology can help me learn, but I need to think deeply about what that means is the shift that I have seen. 
um, which I think is healthy in, in this world. That doesn't mean that everyone coming into the classroom has that perspective immediately. It's something we still need to cultivate. It's something we need to support, as Dr. Copeland mentioned, in the classrooms. Um, and it's something that we need to help veteran teachers who don't have that mindset yet um, to keep learning to, to kind of grow into as well. And it's one of the things I think probably the biggest learning on the Blue Moon, on my lens from the last 15 years working in this sort of capacity is, you know, video is a super, super powerful tool, right? In performance-based professions and athletics, right? We use video ubiquitously because it's the best way to really see what actually happened and how can I get better. In teaching, right, that has not been the norm, and so a lot of, obviously, the more we get to sort of these on-the-job pathways, a lot more video-centric sort of approaches to that learning start to come up and say, well, show what this looks like on a video with your kids. And we always sort of run into, you know, and, and as the generation has gotten more comfortable, right, certainly you've got your, you know, your TikTokers and the like, or they're posting themselves on video all the time. But like the idea that you're sort of putting yourself on video actually feels much more vulnerable but that's often where we find it's sort of bridging to that support model that Dr. Goldman, you sort of mentioned, which is the more you can sort of feel like, all right, I'm going to videotape myself, but this is going to give me right the ability to have somebody actually point out very specifically and concretely what worked, what didn't, and how can I make that better? And how can I really make sure I meet that kid? Right. That's a super powerful shift. And we always get, you know, that upfront vulnerability factor of like, I don't, I don't know what I'm upload a video of myself and, you know, so have somebody sort of watch it and sort of give you feedback. But the moment you start to see the dividends there and see how supportive that can be and how scalable that can be from a week over week, month over month basis, as you're going through the coursework, that's just been a pretty amazing, right, sort of way to think about this next level of sport. I will say the moment you throw AI on top of that, right, it only gets more interesting and more powerful because we can really start to do some things to enable faculty to have really deep, meaningful conversations with candidates about their practice. And that can be the most authentic, right, sort of conversation possible because it's really all about your actual practice. And I think that's what we've been super excited about in just sort of seeing where the shift is going. Yeah, and I, can I just add to that? Because back in the last century, I had to do that for my teacher preparation program on a VHS tape, but there was no way to timestamp um, the comments. And so Drew has actually, we actually did a self-study of this. We implemented video feedback for our interns. Um, and then the comments that they were getting from their field supervisors, from their cooperating teachers, and then their ability to self-reflect and pinpoint exactly in a video where things were happening, increased their reflection and their ability to be reflective practitioners um, hugely, uh, greatly. Um, and so the video and the, the watching what happens in the classroom, I can't say enough about that. And I also acknowledge that there is a level of um, hesitation on the part of schools sometimes to allow teachers to video themselves and to, to do the work of getting parent permissions or working it into the media consents. But understanding that these videos are not going anywhere other than the teacher's reflection and the professor who is commenting on them um, is just an important aspect of this work. Any, I'll, I'd love to just open it up to Q&A. Any other questions, any other thoughts, folks want to make sure that we cover here as we're sort of wrapping things up in the last few minutes? Uh, there's a question in here that's sort of about, right, sort of in our district, we have some talented paras. Love the idea of giving, uh, idea of giving them a pathway for uh, sort of certification, but, right, most don't have BAs. Any accelerated programs for folks like this um, so Dr. Turner, I know we're working on a on-the-job bachelor's degree in education. So I don't know if you want to sort of share a little bit about sort of that update. We can sort of talk about sort of timelines. We're, we're, we're trying to launch that in January. So um, any other Yeah, updates? our hope is that January we're enrolling our first cohort of um, associates to BA. Right now, it's uh, paras with an associate's degree. It, it kind of streamlines some things in terms of state requirements and university requirements, although we may be able to roll out in the future, parents who don't yet have the associate's degree working more fully. Right now, it's in elementary education. Um, and this is, this is an issue with how New Jersey does certification. So in New Jersey, to get a content area certification, you have to have the equivalent of a major in the content area or 30 credits. 
And that work, doing it in this on the job situation is a little bit more difficult, but we're thinking about that. But right now we're really focusing on the elementary um, K-6 certification. And then those students will be able to take nine of the credits that they take in that program and apply it to the TOSD endorsement. So with only um, four more classes after that bachelor's, they will be able to be certified in special education as well, which they could literally do the summer after <laughs> or the fall after they graduate with the bachelor's. And again, with the CE license could immediately go into a special education position when they graduate with that um, certification. So hopefully it's January. And that's actually part of the work on the Bloomboard side. So Lauren and our team and, and sort of our folks, right, can actually help a lot with some of that recruitment and obviously surveys of your paras and getting sort of what level of credit do they have? What, how can they get some of the, if they're just close to an associate, how can they sort of get over the finish line there? So we can certainly be helpful in sort of trying to, to sort of bring and build together that cohort. Um, and then again, we'll enroll our first set of folks in January here and get them into the BA programs and then get them up and running. Across the country, right, we now have a whole bunch, hundreds, thousands of uh, folks in that para role earning bachelor's degrees on the job. And so we're super excited about bringing that to New Jersey because we know it's it's the most powerful, right, sort of pipeline development tool we have found to date. And the idea that then we can extend that into special ed very quickly, as Dr. Turner mentioned, right, with a couple more courses, right, is really the sort of the win because we know the special ed area is just where most of the liability exists at the moment. Any other final questions? Uh, how long is the program for them to receive the BA? It's a, so it's a two year associate to bachelor's. And so they're able to go through and we will, you know, in the long run, we're sort of trying to figure out how we sort of continue to accelerate some of these pathways. Um, it's again, to Dr. Turner's point, it really depends on some state requirements. Um, the state gen ed requirements in the like are, are sort of a little harder in New Jersey. In Ohio, we have a partner where we've been able to actually launch a three-year zero to 120 credit bachelor's degree, but there's a little bit more flexibility in Ohio in that context. So we will certainly be as creative as we can for this first set of cohorts for this next year. We're launching the associate to bachelor's degree, and it's a two-year program to go from associates to get the bachelor's. And then obviously you can add the, the special ed piece right after that. Um, but it's, again, the, the, the entire system is moving towards trying to create more accelerated, more embedded pathways for initial licensure. And so we're excited about that process. I love the school nursing question. Uh, we, we don't have, we, we continue to get pulled into nursing conversations. So it's always one that we joke internally, but uh, not at the moment. We don't have uh, sort of a pipeline of nurses, sorry. Well, I really appreciate the time, Dr. Koblen and Dr. Turner. Any final thoughts, final comments? So again, I really appreciate all your expertise and sort of openness here to, to sort of share. Uh, any final thoughts before we turn over to Sure. Uh, earlier, Dr. Turner ha had mentioned coming together. Uh, and, and that's what this is really all about. Um, districts, university partnerships, uh, external, corporate, uh, just really coming together to, to to solve the root problem of a lack of teachers. And if we look out five to 10 years and the number of current teachers who will be eligible to retire, there are not enough students coming through the university pipeline to fill those re future anticipated retirees. So we have to do something now. And, and coming, coming together will allow us to at least uh, discuss and, and address that issue. And in order to solve the problem, I think we have to break the system and you start doing that by thinking outside the box. So I don't advocate for breaking the law for doing things outside of the regs, but the regs are written vaguely in a lot of situations. And so I think anytime we come up against, well, I can't do that because, let's sit down and have a conversation that might think outside the box about funding or placements or things like that, because maybe we can if we put our heads together and figure out a way around it. I certainly appreciate it. So again, thank you so much for the time. I want to respect everybody sort of we're at the hour here. Uh, we'll send a follow-up email. I know there's some questions around cost. It, cost really just depends on the program and depends on the sort of structure. So we can send that out uh, afterwards here. And if you have other questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to our team. 
Thank you, Dr. Turner. Thank you, Dr. Copeland. Really appreciate time and excited about the uh, the work ahead. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank okay. you.